May 29th, 1985, Richard stole a Mercedes Benz um, and then he drove it to the house of a woman named Mabel Ma Bell. Um, she was 83 and she had a sister living with her, Florence, who was 81. So not to get into like a ton of details, basically he tortured both of these elderly women. He raped them, he mutilated their bodies and basically left them for dead. They were alive when they were found, but they were both in like a comatose sort of state. And Mabel Bell ended up dying later of, of her injuries. Well, the very next day he took that same car and then he drove to Burbank and he snuck into the home of Carol Kyle and she was 42 and she had an 11 year old son. So at gunpoint he bound her and her 11 year old son and he ransacked the house. He ended up like asking her to take him around the house to show him where the valuables were, which she did. And then he ended up raping her. He actually sodomized her. And then, you know, he said like, don't look at me or I'll cut your eyes out, which he had done before. So I think had she done that, he would have done what he said. Um, in the meantime, he had put the son in a closet and before he left, he took him out of the closet and just sort of bound them together and left them there. He did not murder them. On the night of July 2nd, 1985, he drove a stolen Toyota and um, to Arcadia and then he like randomly selected a house and that was the house of Mary Louise Cannon. She was 75. He found her sleeping and he hit her repeatedly in the head with a lamp, stabbed her and she was found murdered dead the next day. July 5th 1985 so I mean this is a really tight like it's just multiple days after days after days of killing so it's July 5th 1985 he um, broke into a home in Sierra Madre and he found 16 year old uh, Whitney Bennett in the home and he ended up bludgeoning her with a tire iron as she slept then he like looked around the house for a knife and he couldn't find one so he tried to strangle her with a telephone cord and when he was doing that like he saw like sparks coming from the telephone cord and he actually thought that that was like Jesus Christ intervening you know he was a Satanist and so that spooked him so he left her there she did survive it took almost 500 stitches to close up the wounds in her head on July 7th of 1985 Ramirez burglarized the home of Joyce Lucille Nelson. She was 61 in, again, this is in Monterey Park. Um, he found her sleeping on her living room couch and then he beat her to death with his fist and he even left an imprint of his shoe on her face. The same night he was like cruising around other places and he ended up back in Monterey Park and he chose the home of Sophie Dickman who was 63 and he assaulted her, handcuffed her, um, attempted to rape her, stole her jewelry. He was asking her if there's more and she's like, I swear there's like, you have everything that I have of value. And he asked her to swear on Satan. On July 20th of 1985, Ramirez purchased a machete. So this person now, okay, so we're on July 20th. So if you even, if you're just talking about the 2000, or the, I'm sorry, if you're just talking about the 1985 murders, we're starting in March of 1985. So it's March, April, May, June, July, August. So this is six months of people just being like completely terrified. Just all these crazy, arbitrary, nonsensical murders and assaults are happening. I guess I just, I feel like maybe I'm being way too rational about this, but if you're in, a, in an area where these crazy murders are happening for a six month period of time, you would think like you couldn't just readily get a machete. Of course, like, you know, I'm sure he probably didn't just like walk into a regular store to buy it. I'm sure he bought it like in a non-legal way to be in with, but still. So July 20th, 1985, he has this machete now and he steals another car and he goes to Glendale. He chooses the home of 66 year old uh, Leela Needing and her husband was there also, his name's Maxon and he was 68. So he just like ran into the room, hacked him up with a machete, and then shot them with a 22 caliber handgun. Where he got that, I'm not sure because the gun he was using before was a 38 caliber. 
and then he mutilated their bodies even more after that and then stole all of their valuables. After this, he stopped to, like, sell their valuables, and then he drove to Sun Valley. At 4.15 a.m., he broke into another home. Um, I'm going to leave the name on the screen because I definitely can't pronounce it. But he shot the man in the head with a 25 caliber gun. Now he's got another gun, and he killed him instantly. He then raped the wife. He beat her, sodomized her, um, and then he, like, tied up their eight-year-old son and took him around the house to have him show him where, like, the valuable stuff was, which, which he took. And then again, he was asking people to, like, swear to Satan that they were telling him where all of the valuables were. On August 6th of 1985, Ramirez drove to Northridge and he broke into the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson. When he like snuck into their, bedro their bedroom, the wife Virginia, who was 27, was like really startled. Um, so I guess that startled him and he shot her instantly with his 25 caliber automatic, semi-automatic handgun. When Chris was attempting, the husband was attempting to flee, he shot him. Chris did attempt to fight back and he did manage to escape Ramirez and both him and the wife did survived. August 8th, 1985, Ramirez stole another car and drove to Diamond Bar and he chose the home of 27-year-old Sakina Abaweth and her husband Elias, who was 31. And sometime after 2.30 a.m., he entered their home. He went to the master bedroom. He instantly killed the husband in the, with a, a shot in the head from the 25 caliber gun. Um, he handcuffed the wife and of course he like asked her to tell him where all the valuables were was raping her and they had a three-year-old son who walked in he tied up the son and then he continued to rape her and then he actually let the son go to a neighbor's house so like he could get help um i i feel like it's interesting that in in each of the scenarios he there when there was a child involved he didn't hurt the child yet he is connected to a murder of a nine-year-old so i'm just like wondering what the connection is with that up until this point ramirez was following the news coverage because obviously there was a ton of news coverage on these murders and horrific crimes so he decided to leave like the la area and go back to the san francisco area so on August 18th, 1985, Ramirez entered the home of Peter and Barbara Penn. Um, Peter, age 66, was killed in his sleep with a gunshot wound from the same. Now he still has this 25 caliber gun. Barbara, age 62, she was beaten and sexually violated before she was shot and left for dead. And he used lipstick to like draw a pentagram which is a satanistic symbol and he had actually done that in other in other crimes he had like written a pentagram and things like that um august 24th 1985 he traveled 76 miles south of la so now he's sort of getting that you know people are catching on they're starting to take notice there's a lot of news coverage um, I would imagine there's a, a bigger police presence, so he leaves and he goes 76 miles south of LA in a stolen Toyota, which a majority of the cars that he sold were Toyotas. I'm not sure what the significance of that. Um, I know sometimes like there are certain cars that are easy, like especially at this time, would have been like easier to break into or maybe easier to jumpstart or, you know, maybe he was familiar with Toyotas so he would know how he could you know jump them or whatever so when he got there he um came across the house of james romero jr who had just gotten back from vacation his 13 year old son was there as well and he like he woke up whenever he heard ramirez's footsteps in the house so he like woke his dad up really quick and because of this ramirez got like freaked out and like he ran but they ended up getting like a partial plate of that toyota and he, they reported it to the police they thought they just like chased away a thief they didn't know at the time like they just chased away richard ramirez so the same day he, he like gets freaked out and he chases away but then he ends up going to 
another house. He breaks into the house of 30-year-old 30, 30 Bill Carnes and his fiance Inez Erickson, who was 29, and he, like, broke in through the back door. He woke them up out of their sleep. He ended up shooting Carnes with his 24 caliber handgun. And then he, he actually told her that he was the Night Stalker because by this time, like, there was a lot of coverage about it. And he asked her, like, swear to Satan. He ended up, like, raping her, of course, stealing her valuables and things like that. And then he made her, like, swear to Satan again. And he actually was like, tell them the Night Stalker was here. So now he's he's bringing in that element that we talked about early early on with the um, like being grandiose, being egocentric. He's like enjoying the fact that, that he's got getting this media attention, and he's actually calling attention to it in his crime. Beyonce was he actually didn't kill him. He did shoot him three times, but they were able to remove two of the bullets, and he did survive his injuries. It almost seems like he tripped up when he was like yes i'm the night stalker tell him the night stalker was here and then like let her go and basically she could give a detailed description of him they already had a composite sketch they got like a casting of his footprint found a car that he had stolen before and got like a partial fingerprint from it and even though he was really good like he actually wiped a lot of the cars down a lot they did find one partial print and because he had a record they ran that print and then they were able to find out that it was him 25 year old drifter from texas um and that he had like a long rap sheet and many many arrests for those you know prior crimes so because of that they already had a mugshot of him because he had been arrested before so on december 12 1984 they released his mugshot in the media and like now the night stalker has a face and then the police hold a press conference and they're basically like, we know who you are and soon everybody else will, so like you can't hide. Residents of the CISO Hotel have claimed that they, you know, putting it together after the fact that they saw Ramirez disposing of bloody clothes behind the CISO and often returning like naked. But I guess at the Cecil Hotel, like, people walk around naked or in a daze or seemingly, like, mentally ill or out of their mind with drugs wasn't unnormal, like, wasn't unusual because that's, like, normal things that happen there. He was actually apprehended by people that were, um, out and around the Cecil Hotel. Like, there was, like, a gang of locals that noticed that it was him and they actually, like, chased him down and beat him until the police could come. Ramirez was convicted on 13 counts of murder, and he was sentenced to death for each one on September 30th, 1989. Um, he was said to be laughing during the trial while they were describing these horrific crimes. He would refer to Satan often in court, and that he was described as cruel, callous, unremorseful, unfeeling. The trial cost... 1.8 million dollars and at the time it was the most expensive trial in california history until the case of oj simpson in 1994 which surpassed that there's been a malt i mean a multitude of books and movies and just tons of stuff articles on richard ramirez and by the end of the trial he became like this weird like celebrity there was like Fans writing him letters, women like wanting to be with him and writing him love letters in prison. He actually had a woman that had written him like 75 letters, Doreen Loy, I think her last name is, and she began visiting him in prison. In 1988, he actually proposed to her, and October 3rd, 1996, they were married in the prison, which like really I'm sorry I don't think you like you should be able to get married in prison like you murdered a jillion people you're sentenced to death like why are we letting them marry people and like let's not even get started on who decides to marry Richard Ramirez so while they were together years before he died she would say like once he died like she would commit suicide but they actually ended up separating and like when they really did the calculation he would have been in his early 70s before the state of California would actually have been able to execute him. But he did die in prison on June 7th of 2013. 
Um, it was complications from B cell lymphoma, and he was said that he was. It was said that he was infected by diseases related to his chronic substance abuse, including hepatitis C. He was 53 years old, and he had been on death row more than 23 years. So that's the case of Richard Ramirez. Let me know like what your thoughts are about this. Um, you know, it, it's indisputable. The things that he did were horrific. They were cruel. They were mutilation. Just the sheer amount of crimes that he committed in that time period is just, like, I can't even really wrap my brain around that. I'm just interested to see, like, what you think about this. Thank you for watching. Thank you for stopping by my channel. I will be posting videos like this once a week. The next video coming up is going to be Jack Unterweger, who was said to be a Ramirez copycat. He also stayed at the Cecil Hotel. Um, if you like these types of videos, give it a thumbs up. Um, please consider subscribing. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.